Polymerase chain reaction, or PCR, is a core technique that has become the key underpinning of many other tools within the molecular biologist's toolkit. In its simplest form, it allows us to amplify a specific region of DNA using two primers that are complementary to the target of interest. This involves mixing the target DNA with gene-specific primers, a thermostable polymerase enzyme, and the building blocks of DNA, DNTPs, and cycling this mixture 30 to 35 times in stages through different temperatures. Firstly, the mixture is heated to about 95 degrees to denature the double-stranded DNA into its constitutive strands. Then it is cooled to about 60 degrees to allow the annealing of the primers to the DNA template, followed by incubation at 72 degrees to allow the polymerase enzyme to extend the primers on both strands, using the added DNTPs to create two new pieces of double-stranded DNA, or amplicons, where before there was only one. And then this process is repeated by heating again. As the cycles continue, a minute quantity of DNA can be amplified exponentially into huge and readily detectable numbers in less than two hours. From this basic start, we can clone genes, sequence them, modify them, and most importantly for this topic under discussion, we can quantify the DNA itself using quantitative PCR or qPCR. qPCR is sometimes referred to as real-time PCR, as instead of simply performing the PCR reaction and then quantifying the amount of DNA at the end, qPCR is able to provide a signal relative to the amount of DNA after each cycle of the PCR reaction and therefore we get a real-time, as it's happening, insight into the reaction itself. qPCR is very similar to regular PCR in that it involves the same basic components, a polymerase enzyme, DNTPs, gene-specific primers, and target DNA. However, in order to get a measure of the DNA replication as it's happening, an additional fluorescent molecule is added that only produces a signal if the PCR amplification is successful. There are two main types of fluorescent molecules used for qPCR, and I'll briefly introduce them to you now. The first and simplest is the use of cyber green, which is a molecule added to the reaction that binds to DNA non-specifically. But importantly, it only becomes fluorescent when it's bound to the DNA. Therefore, the more amplicon in the sample, the more fluorescent it becomes. The second, the TACMAN assay, includes a special fluorescent probe, which is a DNA strand, just like primers, complementary to a section within the amplicon. The probe contains a fluorophore at one end to provide the fluorescent signal, but this is prevented from releasing its fluorescence by its proximity to a quencher molecule on the other end of the probe. This absorbs any light that's released from the fluorophore. The probe binds the target DNA at the same time as the primers, but during the extension stage, the nuclease activity present within the polymerase cuts the probe up, thereby freeing the fluorophore from its quencher and resulting in a fluorescent signal, which again increases with each cycle as more amplicons are generated. All this requires a machine to read the amount of fluorescence, called a qPCR machine. These shine a laser at the sample and measure the fluorescence released at each cycle of the PCR reaction. If the sample contains the target template, the fluorescent signal will increase, and this is plotted graphically as signal intensity against cycle number to produce an amplification curve. The amplification curve is used to provide a standardized measure of amplification termed the CT value, which is the cycle at which the fluorescent signal reaches a user-defined threshold and is directly proportional to the amount of starting material. The CT value can then be used to give a numerical value of the amount of starting material in the sample, either relative to the, another gene, using what is known as the delta-delta CT method, or as an absolute value calculated using a standard curve generated by a set of standards of known quantities of the target gene, as shown here. When looking at the amplification plot, you will note that after the exponential phase, the signal reaches a plateau. This is due to the buildup of inhibitory molecules that reduce the efficiency of the reaction and reaction components becoming limited. The plateau is the reason that normal PCR is not quantitative. As given a sufficient number of cycles, it doesn't matter how much starting material is present, the final amount of DNA amplified will always be the same. QRT-PCR or quantitative reverse transcriptase PCR, uses the same principle as qPCR, but a different starting material. Instead of directly measuring the DNA, as is used for qPCR, qRT-PCR uses RNA as its starting material. But for the PCR reaction to work, the RNA template is first copied into DNA using a handy retroviral enzyme reverse transcriptase. Once the DNA is generated from the, from the RNA, it can be quantified by qPCR to provide a measure of the parental RNA in the sample. These techniques are incredibly powerful and allow a wide variety of studies to be performed. 
For example, the QRT-PCR action can be used to quantify the levels of HIV-1 virions in the blood of infected patients, thereby ensuring that their drug regimes are working to repress viral replication. And QPCR can be used to estimate the frequency of infected cells in the patient. The sample shown in the experiment behind me are of a QPCR experiment to observe the process of reverse transcription of HIV in different cell types that only differ by a single gene. This then allows me to observe the effect of that gene on HIV replication in a highly sensitive, specific, accurate and controlled manner.